Hello everyone and welcome back to another reaction. Today we're continuing the Napoleonic War series. This time it's about Napoleon's invasion of Spain, 1808. Let's go. An Epic History TV, History March collaboration. Supported by our sponsor, Osprey Publishing. In the autumn of 1807, French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte dominated Europe. He had humbled Austria and Prussia, and sealed an alliance with Russia. Of the major powers, only Britain still defied him, safe from invasion thanks to its powerful navy. Napoleon had ordered all territory controlled by France or its allies to stop trading with Britain, the so-called Continental System, or Blockade designed to wreck Britain's economy and force its government to make peace. But neutral Portugal had continued to trade with its historic ally, Britain. So Napoleon sent an army under General Junot to occupy the country. Yes, uh, basically in 1807, Napoleon ordered Portugal to join the continental system. They all, he also said that Portugal must declare war on Britain which was their longtime ally, and is still their longtime ally, you might add. And uh, of course, Portugal refused these outrageous demands. They were outrageous. And that gave Napoleon a pretext for invading Portugal. Now, in 1807, a secret treaty was drawn up between Spain and France, the so-called Treaty of Fontainebleau, and it specified that Portugal should be partitioned into three parts. The northern part would be named the Kingdom of North Lusitania, and it would be ruled by Charles II, the Duke of Parma. That's the dukedom in Italy. And the middle part, central Portugal, would be controlled directly by France. That included the capital, Lisbon. And the southern part would uh, uh, establish the Principality of the Alva Alvares, and that would be ruled by Manuel Godoy, the chief minister of Spain, and he would receive the title of prince. Now, obviously, this did not happen, and uh, we're about to find out why. Uh, General Juno was given command of this invasion force, and Juno was a very capable general, and were it not for certain events in his later career, he would have probably made a marshal of the empire eventually. And so that's a tidbit about him. And force it into line. The invasion was supported by France's ally, Spain. Though privately, Napoleon held Spain's rulers in contempt. I should mention, this is the House of Bourbon-Anjou still the ruling house of Spain and it is a cadet branch of or rather a branching line of the House of Bourbon which uh, had at times ruled France, Naples and many other uh, states in Europe and the House of Bourbon of course was uh, um, forced out of France after the revolution but anyways uh, that was a tangent uh, sideline there. Anyways, uh, Charles IV, he was an absolute monarch in theory, but he only ever took a passive interest in governance. Uh, it's a large contrast to his father, Charles III, Carlos III, and he actively pursued reforms, and he had many able ministers that helped him to try to reinvigorate the Spanish Empire, which at this point was on a steep decline you could say it was no longer uh, it was a shadow of its former glory days of the 16th and 17th centuries now we see here um that charles the fourth he hated his son uh, and the son hated him uh, and uh, you know basically this led to a bunch of infighting resulting in a coup attempt by Crown Prince Fernando, even. So yeah, Spain was in a very chaotic situation in many ways, and the country, to top it all off, was run by the Queen's lover, Manuel Godoy, I mentioned him earlier. So yeah, um, you could see how 
both the Spanish people and people from the outside, like Napoleon, would view the royal family as uh, very corrupt and decadent. The Bourbon royal family was decadent and corrupt. The king and crown prince loathed each other. While the country was effectively run by Chief Minister Manuel Godoy, the Queen's lover. Spain, Napoleon concluded, was backwards, militarily weak and incompetently governed. But he devised a plan to seize control of the country. And he was right on all of these points, to be fair to Napoleon. But that did not give him a right to invade Spain. Spaniards, after a long agony, your nation was perishing. I have seen your pain, and I am bringing you a remedy. This is a very arrogant proclamation by Napoleon, and Napoleon was certainly arrogant at times. Uh, often he had the ability to back up his statements, but in this case he had sorely mistaken basically everything about Spain. This reminds me of the whole let's bring democracy to the Middle East uh, mantra that came from the United States in the early 2000s. And uh, we all know how that went. And this is very reminiscent. He thinks he can just march in there and people will accept French domination of uh, Spain. And the Spanish are very proud people, as we will see. In the spring of 1808, under the pretext of guarding Spain against the British, French troops took up strategic positions around the country. Yes, and the thing about this sort of pre-invasion was that the Spanish fortress commanders didn't know how to respond to this, because technically on paper, France was still uh, allied to Spain, so when they marched into Spain, they were often able to occupy these fortresses without a fight. They were welcomed as allies. They had not received any instructions on how to act against the French from the central government. And it shows the complete ineptitude of uh, Godoy's uh, rule. And yeah, it really exposes how poor of a state Spain is at this point. The Spanish people saw the French military presence as the latest in a long line of humiliations and held Chief Minister Manuel Godoy responsible. There were riots at the palace of Aranjuez. Godoy was nearly lynched. Napoleon invited the Spanish royal family and Godoy to take refuge in the French city of Bayonne and sent Marshal Murat and 50,000 troops to restore order in Madrid. But on the second... Should be mentioned here that uh, at this stage, uh, Marshal Muir actually hoped that he would be made the King of Spain. And uh, this mission only reinforced those beliefs Napoleon would make him King of Spain. But it was not to be. 2nd of May 1808, the people of Madrid rose up against Murat's soldiers. It became known as the Dos de Mayo Uprising, immortalized by the artist Francisco Goya. This scene shows Mamelukes of Napoleon's Imperial Guard attacked by the citizens of Madrid. Yes, um, this is actually an interesting uh, uh, bit of information here. The Napoleon, when he was in Egypt, on his expedition there, he recruited Mamluks and formed actually an elite detachment of Mamluk cavalry, which were a part of the Imperial Guard. So these were trusted troops, these were elite troops, and uh, this is probably the last real Mamluk military force anywhere actually. And he used them in many of his campaigns. They participated in Austerlitz, for example. Their numbers were quite small, comparatively speaking. But uh, yeah, this is very interesting that Napoleon allowed Muslim soldiers to serve in a very prominent role in his army. 
and uh, Napoleon's famous bodyguard, uh, Rostam Rasa, I think his name was. I probably did not cr uh, pronounce that correctly. Anyways, he was also a Mamluk who had been had been a slave in Egypt. Uh, Napoleon took him as his valet and bodyguard, and he served with them all the way until the end in 1814. A hundred soldiers were killed. The French responded ruthlessly. Yeah, but uh, as we can see, the situation is quickly spiraling out of control for Napoleon. Shooting down dozens in the streets and executing more than a hundred by firing squad. Meanwhile, in Bayonne, Napoleon forced King Carlos to abdicate and bestowed the title King of Spain on his own brother, Joseph. Yes, and uh, Carlos, of course, he abdicated. Crown Prince Fernando was taken captive, basically, and was held in house arrest in France for several years until in 1813, when Napoleon had to release him. Uh, four reasons we will get to. At this point, Joseph is already the king of Naples. And uh, in order to receive the Spanish crown, he abdicated as the king of Naples and became the king of Spain. Consequently, uh, Marshal Murat, who had hoped to become the king of Spain, was given the kingdom of Naples. So it didn't turn out all too bad for Murat. Who is the enemy of your happiness? Napoleon, emperor of the French. What is Napoleon's origins from evil? You could see Napoleon was not a popular figure in Spain even at this early stage of the Peninsular War. That summer, as Napoleon forced a new modernizing constitution on Spain. Yes, this was called the Bayonne Constitution, and it was in the spirit of the Revolution Parkley and Bonaparte's own constitutional designs. Uh, it established an independent judiciary, a, tr a tricameral legislature. It put some nominal limits on royal power, but not very effective ones. Catholicism remained the state religion. This, and if it was truly in the spirit of the revolution, there would be no state religion at all. But yes, Catholicism retained its special status in Spain and it shows how there were a few Spanish notables who influenced the drafting of this particular constitution. And, uh, well, most provisions of this constitution, although they sort of liberal uh, for the time, was, it was never put in practice because it was suspended by the French military authorities who governed the various parts of the country. And overall, uh, King Joseph even though he really tried to govern the country competently, was never given the opportunity to do so due to the extenuating circumstances. However, there were some uh, serious attempts at liberal reforms. Uh, feudalism was abolished. The country was divided into French-style departments. Internal custom borders and uh, state monopolies were abolished. State-owned factories were privatized. And the Napoleonic Code was sort of introduced as the new legal code of Spain. So there were some serious attempts at reform. And uh, this is not unique for Spain. France, uh, or rather Napoleon, tried to do this everywhere he went. to, And with varying degrees of success, I would say. But uh, these ideas of the French Revolution that Napoleon helped to spread would have an enormous impact on the rest of the 19th century. And his brother Joseph entered Madrid as its new king. The Spanish reacted with fury. The French weren't just arrogant foreigners trampling on their national honor. They were godless atheists who during the French Revolution had rejected the Pope and Catholic Church. Yes, that is true. However, Napoleon restored the Catholic Church to France through a deal with the Pope known as the Concordat of 1801, and it put heavy limits on the power and influence of the Catholic Church in France, but it was restored. Vast lands that the Church owned pre-revolution 
was not restored to the church. However, they were allowed to operate in France again. And the relationship between state and church was heavily slanted in the state's favor. Napoleon was allowed to select the bishops and he oversaw church finances. The Gregorian calendar was restored. The old French revolutionary calendar was abolished in 1805 and Christian holidays were also restored. And Napoleon's attitude towards religion can be discussed at length. He was quite utilitarian in nature to religion. He saw it as a tool for power, basically. And this restoration of relationship between France and the Catholic Church enabled him to win support of many French Catholics for his regime. Napoleon, priests warned the peasants, was the very Antichrist himself. Revolts erupted across the country. The Spanish army was joined by militias and partisans who attacked French troops and killed collaborators. French soldiers carried out savage reprisals. No mercy was shown. The countless atrocities horrified Francisco Goya. Yes, already at these initial stages of the Peninsula War, the nature of the war is already very, very different from all the other campaigns Napoleon has fought so far. The sheer brutality on both sides, uh, should be said, was absolutely horrifying. And the war would gradually, as the Spanish armies were defeated on in pitch battles, would result in partisan warfare, guerrilla tactics, basically. And the French had had some experience fighting uh, insurgencies from the Vendée revolt during the revolution. However, uh, most French commanders and soldiers had no idea how it was to fight such a war. And Spain's terrain with its mountainous uh, mountains and hills was quite ideal for this type of warfare. And it could have not been conducted if, if the war was waged in, say, Austria or some other uh, Central European country. So, uh, yeah, there are already many flashing red lights about this intervention of Napoleon's. And led to his famous Disasters of War series. Hello, everyone. Thanks to some... Uh, Errors in the recording software, about half of this reaction was lost. So I will try my best to recap what I said during the parts that were lost. Let's get uh, going again. At first, it seemed the French would easily put down the revolt. Girona, Valencia and Zaragoza were besieged by French troops, while the Spanish army of Galicia was routed by Marshal Bessier at the Battle of Medina del Rio Seco. But eight days later, as General Dupont and three French divisions withdrew from Cordoba, slowed down by wagons piled high with loot, they were surrounded at Bailen by General Castaño's army of Andalusia and forced to surrender. Uh, yes, um, General Dupont was a promising general during the Revolutionary and the early Napoleonic Wars, actually. And uh, I think he had a very promising career ahead of him if this had not had happened. Now, in Dupont's defense, he had a bunch of raw levies with him, and he had some very bad luck. Uh, but basically what happened when he was eventually released from captivity was that he was sent before a court-martial by Napoleon, who didn't take into account the extenuating circumstances Dupont was operating under, and he was stripped of both his rank and title. Um, he would make a comeback during the Second Restoration, when he was appointed uh, Minister of War for a few months by uh, Louis XVIII. But his uh, radical policies, as the monarchy considered it, made him quite unpopular, and he was 
forced to resign eventually. The Spanish took 18,000 French prisoners, about half of whom later died of starvation. Berlin was a humiliation for France, her first major defeat since Napoleon became emperor. France's enemies across Europe were delighted. Napoleon was incandescent with fury. The situation went from bad to worse. The Portuguese joined the revolt, while fierce Spanish resistance forced the French to abandon the sieges of Valencia, Girona and Saragossa. Spain's new king, Joseph Bonaparte, was even forced to flee the capital. The British assisted the revolt, which the Spanish now called a war of independence, by shipping weapons to Spain using the Royal Navy. Yes, and this is sometimes what we call proxy warfare, where two nations are fighting through intermediaries, or one of the nations at least, and we see this today, that during the Ukraine war, where Ukraine is heavily dependent on both money and weapons from Western nations in order to continue the war effort. So this is hardly a unique circumstance for Spain. On the 1st of August, a small British army commanded by Sir Arthur Wellesley landed in Portugal to aid their revolt. On the 17th of August, he beat a small French force at Rolisa. Then four days... Yes, uh, Sir Arthur Wellesley is the, what, who, the one who would become the Duke of Wellington, one of the most famous commanders of the Napoleonic Wars. Of course, he defeated Napoleon at the Battle of Waterloo, 1815. He is probably the second best general overall in, during, this, uh, during the Napoleonic Wars, after Napoleon, of course. And uh, I know people who even consider him better than Napoleon, but I'm not quite ready to go that far. But yeah. ...later beat Junot's main army at the Battle of Vimero. But Wellesley's newly arrived superior, Sir Hugh Dalrymple, then agreed to repatriate Junot and his army to France with all their arms and plunder using British ships. In Britain, the generous terms were seen as a disgrace and scandal. Yes, the convention of Sindra is quite uh, confounding, really. Not quite sure why Dalrymple agreed to such a generous uh, deal with the French. And uh, as far as I know, Dalrymple actually tried to put some of the blame on uh, Sir Arthur Wellesley. However, the inquiry exonerated him, and uh, Dalrymple was quietly pushed into retirement, never to be heard from again. A subsequent inquiry exonerated Wellesley, the future Duke of Wellington, but Dalrymple never held command again. Everywhere I am absent, they commit nothing but follies. And this is a continuing problem that we will see exacerbated during the later campaigns, is that when these campaigns get both larger and take longer in time, the problems of Napoleon not being there to directly supervise his marshals and generals become quite evident. Now, Napoleon was an excellent military leader and he made all his subordinates much better than they were supposed to. He knew every one of his general's uh, qualities and how to use them most effectively. But only a few marshals were capable of independent command. And even then, they were not as good as they were under Napoleon. And that is a true testament to Napoleon's military leadership. Napoleon decided the only way to sort out the situation in Spain was to go there himself. He assembled 130,000 reinforcements, including many of his best troops, and on the 7th of November led a second invasion of Spain. 
most Spanish troops were inexperienced, were often badly equipped and led, and their armies had no coherent strategy. They were no match for the Grande Armée, which burst across the Ebro River. Yes, uh, at this point, the Spanish army was a far cry from uh, the glory days of the 15 and 1600s, where the Spanish tercio formations had dominated the battlefields of Europe. And this just reflects the overall decline of the Spanish Empire as a world power. And at this point, you could barely call it a world power. And inflicted heavy defeats on the Spanish at Borgos and Tudela. At Tudela, Marshal Land's Third Corps avenged the defeat at Bailin by smashing the army of General Castaños, sending it fleeing in two directions. Napoleon pushed on rapidly. North of Madrid, 8,000 Spanish held the mountain pass at Somosierra. Napoleon, impatient to break through to the capital, ordered forward the Polish Light Horse of the Guard. Yes, this is one of the most memorable moments in the Napoleonic Wars, where Napoleon ordered his elite Polish Light Horse of the Guard to charge the Spanish guns head-on to enable the French to quickly get to Madrid, and they did. It's a testament to the bravery and effectiveness of Polish troops. And uh, they really deserved to be part of this, of the Imperial Guard. In an attack of almost suicidal bravery, they charged the Spanish guns head on and enabled the French to take the pass. Four days later, after Napoleon threatened to obliterate the city, Madrid opened its gates to his army. Unaware of the disaster engulfing Spanish forces, a 20,000-strong British army, commanded by Sir John Moore, had just arrived in Salamanca after a 300-mile march from Lisbon, with another smaller force en route from Coruña. The British army was inexperienced, but in contrast to most Spanish forces, it was well-trained, organized, and led. Yes, at this point, uh, Britain has not conducted any major land wars for a while. And the British army had been down-prioritized in favor of the Royal Navy, of course, which actually employed more men at this stage of the war. Eventually, the British army would grow as the war continued to rage on. However, the army at this time was small and inexperienced. However, like they said, it had leadership, it was well-equipped and drilled. As news reached more of the Spanish collapse, he nevertheless planned to divert French forces by attacking Marshal Soult's isolated Second Corps and threatening Napoleon's communications to Burgos and France. At Sagun on the 21st of December, the British 15th Hussars advanced overnight through winter frost and made a dawn attack on a French cavalry brigade, routing it in one great charge. But as Moore prepared a full-scale attack on Soult's corps, he received news that Napoleon was advancing rapidly towards him with his main army from Madrid. I am pursuing the English sword to their kidneys. While two French corps under Marshal Lannes began a second bloody siege of Zaragoza, Napoleon saw a chance to get to grips with the British at last. Yes, Napoleon had never had the opportunity to crush a British army in the field before, and this was probably the best chance he was ever going to get. And if he can destroy this army, which is Britain's only army at this point, he might be able to force terms with Britain. Now, I don't think that is very likely anyways, but it probably was Napoleon's best chance to get some form of peace deal with Britain. 
intending to trap Moore between his own forces and Soult's second corps. He force-marched his troops over the icy Guadarrama Pass in the midst of a blizzard. Moore, facing odds of more than two to one, immediately ordered a retreat, planning to march 250 miles to the coast, where his army could be evacuated by the Royal Navy. For both sides, the race to the sea was an exhausting slog through mountains, mud and bitter cold. Many fell by the wayside as British discipline collapsed, leading to looting and drunkenness, except among the rear guard, which fought several skillful delaying actions and kept the French at bay. Soldiers of Britain's elite 95th Rifles were prominent in these skirmishes. This specialised light infantry regiment wore green uniforms for better concealment and were one of the few units on any side armed with rifles. Unlike the standard smoothbore musket, rifles had spiral grooves in the barrel that spun the bullet as it was fired, making them slower to load, but much more accurate. In one legendary incident during Moore's retreat at Cacabelos, rifleman Tom Plunkett picked out and shot dead a French general at 400 yards, some say further. That's very impressive, actually. Thanks to the skill of the rear guard and the desperate pace of the retreat, the British kept one step ahead of the French. On New Year's Eve, Napoleon received grave news from Paris. Rumours of plots and Austria mobilising once more for war. Yes, at this uh, point the Austrian Empire has had time to reform their armies, largely along Napoleonic lines and strengthen their armies just more generally. And uh, of course they and everyone else could see what was going on in Spain, that things were not proceeding as smoothly as Napoleon has hoped. And this is the problem, the long-term strategic problem for France is that it's engaged in a war in Spain that is tying up so many troops who are so desperately needed on other fronts. And uh, yeah, this is a re problem we will see in the future videos. The Emperor immediately left for France, taking many of his best troops with him, and entrusted Marshal Soult and Second Corps with finishing off the British. The pursuit continued, but on the 11th of January 1809, Moore's ragged army reached Coruña. For Sir John Moore's exhausted army, the Spanish port meant supplies, rest, and the prospect of rescue. But few ships were there to meet them on the 11th. Fortunately, the British had been able to blow up bridges behind them to delay Marshal Soult's advance. And three days later, on the 14th of January, the naval transports arrived, allowing Moore to begin embarking his cavalry and artillery. But the very next day, Soult's army appeared on the hills south of Coruña, taking up positions on the heights of Peñascuedo. As you can see, it's Marshal Soult who is in command of this corps. Now, Marshal Soult is one of the more capable marshals of Napoleon's empire. And uh, he was one of very few who could actually handle the responsibility of independent command. And he would spend most of the rest of his career in Spain, fighting what was admittedly an uphill battle. And he will do a mixed job. Some successes, of course, but many more defeats, one could say. And of course, it was not a situation that was easily solved by any means. So uh, I'm not sure how much blame we should put on Soul's shoulder for that. I don't think there were many others that could handle this job. And of course, like everyone else, Soult was more effective while under Napoleon's direct command. 
where he sighted his main battery of cannon. Half of Moore's army deployed in a defensive line two miles south of the city, with two divisions held back to protect his right flank. Both armies were roughly 16,000 strong. The French had four regiments of dragoons, while the... Yes, but dragoons were basically mounted infantry, best suited for reconnaissance and policing operations, and they were not really meant for doing any cavalry charges in the traditional sense. British cavalry was already aboard ship, but the broken terrain of walls, hedges and olive trees made it a battlefield ill-suited to cavalry. And not just ill-suited to cavalry, it's quite ill-suited to infantry, because during this time, armies rely on the line formation, and the line formation is most effective if the lines can be kept coherent in a line. And when the terrain is so bad as it is, with the broken ground and all that, it's quite hard to form a line, actually. So, yeah. The British are set up on a quite a strong defensive position, and it uh, it's in their advantage, basically. Salt's plan was to attack the British right flank and trap Moore's army against the sea. Around 2 p.m., the French artillery opened fire. Then Mermet's infantry division advanced, supported by La Housse's dragoons on his left. Moore had been unsure if Salt would attack, and had just ordered Paget's division to begin embarkation. Now he hurriedly cancelled that order, ordering Paget instead to bring up his men to reinforce his open flank, and Fraser's division to take up position on the heights of Santa Margarita. The French advanced through hedges and over walls, with heavy firing from skirmishers on both sides. Then the British counterattacked. The 42nd Highlanders and 50th Foot charged into the village of Elvinia and drove the French out. But in confused fighting, they in turn were soon pushed back to their own lines. Sir John Moore was close to the front line, observing developments, urging on officers and men. But as he ordered up the Guards Brigade to reinforce the line, he was hit in the shoulder by a cannonball. The amount of generals that were hit by a cannonball during the Napoleonic Wars is quite staggering, actually, and uh, it's almost the most common uh, form of death. I don't have any statistics to back that up, but that's just how it feels sometimes. He remained conscious, but it was obvious the wound was fatal, and he was carried back to the city. Soult sent forward Merle's division to support the attack on Elvinia. Scottish General Sir John Hope had taken over command of the British army from the dying moor, and he ordered forward two battalions of infantry to meet the French attack. Paget's division, led by skirmishers of the 95th Rifles, arrived to shore up the British right flank. The terrain was so bad for horses that French dragoons chose to dismount and fight on foot, but were slowly pushed back by the British. Paget's advance threatened the flank of Mermet's attack on Elvinia, and he too was forced to withdraw, while an attack on the right by Delabord's infantry secured a foothold in the village of Piedra Longa, but got bogged down in heavy skirmishing. Around 6 p.m., dusk fell, and firing died out across the battlefield. News that the British line had held reached Moore shortly before he died in Coruña, around 8 p.m. That night, the British lit campfires and posted sentries, then silently withdrew to Coruña to begin embarkation. The next morning, the French found the enemy positions abandoned, but they were slow to take advantage. It wasn't until noon that they were able to bring up six cannon, 
and get them into position overlooking the Bay of Corunia. The British had almost completed their evacuation by the time the French guns opened fire. In a hurried departure, a few British transports ran aground and two were set on fire, but overall, losses were light. A small Spanish garrison held Coruña, waiting until the British fleet had escaped to sea before surrendering. I hope the people of England will be satisfied. I hope my country will do me justice. Whether Moore's retreat to Coruña was a British disaster or miraculous escape is still debated. And did he abandon Spain in its hour of need or draw off Napoleon's main force, buying time for others? Either way, Britain's only army had been saved and would return to fight another day. Yes, and that's the main point, isn't it? If the British army had been defeated here or even destroyed completely, it might even incentivize the some people in parliament, for example, that uh, this war was not worth it or something like that. You never know. And, uh, well, the fact remains, though, that the British army had been sent to Spain to expel the French but, in reality, they had been forced into a humiliating retreat during the winter, which led to uh, havoc among the army, and their health and morale just declined dramatically. And uh, back in England, contemporary reaction to the campaign was that of criticism over Moore's handling of the overall campaign. In Coruña, actually, Marshal Soult apparently took care of Moore's grave and uh, ordered a monument to be raised in his memory. I'm not sure if that's true, but uh, I have no reason to doubt the information. So if you know anything about that, uh, make sure to leave a comment. While Napoleon now faced the prospect of a long war on the Iberian Peninsula and renewed conflict with Austria, a war on two fronts that would challenge his empire like never before. Napoleon had blundered in Spain, but it was years before the scale of his mistake was evident. Then he would say, I embarked pretty badly on this affair, I admit it. The immorality showed too obviously, the injustice was too cynical. The whole of it remains very ugly. Yes, and uh, that's the thing about Napoleon, he sort of realized many of these mistakes when it was already too late. Many of these mistakes he admitted while on exile at St. Helena. And, uh, well, at least he admitted that things were... that this whole affair was pretty bad overall. You could say, mildly. And, uh, you know, sometimes this war is called Napoleon's Vietnam. Napoleon himself, I believe, called it his bleeding ulcer. And, you know, we all know how the Vietnam War ended for the United States. It... Uh, was a prolonged guerrilla conflict that just cost the lives of thousands of Americans with little to show for it, and that's sort of exactly what happened here, actually. But anyways, uh, we've reached the end of the video, and uh, please leave a like if you like the video, subscribe, and of course, leave a comment. I love when people leave uh, comments that uh, add some context or some other information that could be interesting to the conversation and I will respond to everything. But yeah, until then, I'll see you next time.